In the Netherlands, grid congestion has reached a critical point, with projects stalled and business waiting for solutions. But with new approaches to flexibility, storage and financing, the path forward is clearer than it seems. This is Powering the Future, a podcast series brought to you by Smart Grid Forums. One planet, one power grid. Joining us today is Jeff Cartanegra, Program Manager for Congestion Solutions at Alianda, and he's here to explore how integrated BESS, innovative contracts and private equity could unlock the next phase of the energy transition. Okay, welcome Jeff to the podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So Jeff, before we get started, it would be really great to know a bit more about your role and responsibilities at Alianda. Um, yeah, so I'm Jeff. I'm uh, 41 years old, live in the Netherlands, and I uh, work for Alianda. Ali- <clears throat> Ali- so Alianda is uh, one of the uh, three bigger uh, DSOs in the Netherlands, mm-hmm. and I'm a project manager working on congestion solutions. Now, I know that you're working on some really exciting projects right now. Just to give context to those, Jeff, it would be good for our audience who are viewing from all over the world, actually, to understand the Dutch grid scenario. So can you tell us a bit about why the Dutch grid is so saturated right now? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, so the Netherlands is uh, quite advanced on, uh, for example, uh, solar panels. So the Netherlands was one of the first countries who uh, adopted uh, the renewable energy. So mm-hmm. what you see in, in households on local level is that uh, there are many solar panels. Um, and on the industrial level, we have also a lot of windmill farms and we're creating a lot of new windmill farms. So mm-hmm. currently we have approximately 12 gigawatts on uh, windmill farm production sites uh, offshore. And the goal from the government is to uh, expand it in 2040 to 2050 up to 70 uh, gigawatts of windmill production. Yeah. So it means that we have a lot of production mm-hmm. of uh, renewable energy. But of course, when you have production, you also need to have um, the usage. And what, of course, we see uh, all over the world is that um, this doesn't go totally synchronized. So demand and production is not balanced yet, meaning that we've got still issues on moving all the, the renewable energy around because um, yeah, it's not yet balanced yet. Well, that's on industrial level. And then on local level, we have got, we've got, of course, and that's, I think, the same all around the world, we've got a grid that has been built over the past, let's say, a couple of decades, Mm -hmm. and that is focused on local usage before. So before we only used the grid, and nowadays we have electric cars, we have a lot of electrical products, and so we're using the grid in a very different way than we were uh, used to do it, and means that the use of the grid has to be more flexible, and the flexibility is not yet available in most grids, and that's also the same in the Netherlands, and because we are so far ahead on... Um, changing, uh, doing the energy, transi- doing the energy transition, and changing towards, uh, let's say, uh, the electricity grid 2.0. We've mm-hmm. got more issues in the Netherlands, and we're ahead of uh, on, on on many countries on the problems. That's right. The Netherlands seem to be ahead of the game in many cases um, in Europe in terms of uh, the energy transition, grid modernization, the uptake of um, renewables and electric vehicles. Um, with that in mind, um, why is the flexibility issue not resolved yet? What what needs to change or happen for the Netherlands to really raise their standard in flexibility? Uh, that's again a good question. Um, so it's 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 it's. Uh, uh, I already said it's partly um, a, f- um, a flex uh, um, a, b- a balancing thing. So we need to have our um, demand in line with our production. So yeah. currently, you could say we are ahead on renewable production, yeah. but we're not using it on the right moments and on the right locations where we are producing it. So it means that we need to move a lot around. Uh, we need to move a lot around of our of our of our renewable energy. Yeah. So I would say that would be number one, yeah. getting uh, production uh, more near our uh, uh, the production of renewable energy more near our sites where we're going to use it. Mm -hmm. Um, in combination with, I think, also more flexibility. So we need to be able to deal with the flexibility that renewable energy brings with. So it means that sometimes we have sun, sometimes we have less sun. During the day, we have solar energy. During the night, we don't have solar energy. Sometimes we have more wind than on other moments. In the winter, there's a different energy profile renewable than in the summer. So it means that we need to have uh, a grid that's able to deal with this flexibility and this takes ju- this just takes time because we build our current grid over let's say 60 70 years of time 
Uh, we always call it the Marshall Plan. So after Second World War, we started building the current grid and many of our key assets in the Dutch grid are still based on that system and on the hardware that we built during around, let's say, 1960s, 1970s. So we need to uh, slowly renew it to 2025, 2026, um, uh, uh, what this time uh, is demanding now right. and how we're using it. Battery storage. So uh, that's, you know, a very popular technology. It's The take up has been quite immense in the last 12 months, I understand, uh, worldwide. How are you leveraging that? What role will it play in the future for the Alianda grid? Um, well, let's say first in general, I think that flexibility, as I said, is very important. Mm -hmm. um, and it needs to be, uh, that's my personal opinion, a balance between various products. So um, we are talking about, your, you're, you're talking about batteries, but I think it, it should be ideally a mix between uh, wind energy, solar energy, batteries, uh, probably uh, sort of a, a water water based uh, uh, production, mm -hmm. um, uh, energy, nuclear power, of course, is in France very large. So I think it's it's a combination. Um, but for sure, batteries are a very interesting and, in my personal opinion, a very important uh, flexibility product because um, batteries can be used very quickly, can be used on demand for um, getting loads off the grid or getting loads uh, into the grid. There is a discussion at the moment about um, and, and regulation around how batteries are leveraged um, across Europe. Some utilities uh, would prefer to leverage battery storage through services. Others want to own and control those assets directly. What's your view at Aliander on this? Um, well, Aliander is still, uh, as many TSOs and TSOs, forming uh, a policy. And as many DSOs and TSOs, there are internal discussions about what is the exact value, what are the exact risks on the grid stability, and what do we actually want? Mm -hmm. So what you see is that the products uh, that we need, and then I mean products like con contractual products that we need to give to client, to our clients, to the market, to to industries, to say, okay, we need battery, pro we need uh, flexibility in battery via batteries. This is a contract, and via this contract, you can provide uh, balancing services. So what we see is that these products are still under development. Mm -hmm. But we do know, as you already said, that we have problems and we actually already need the flexibility. So this is something where we are not synchronized in what we actually at this point need and where we are in the process. So that's that's what I meant earlier, that we are still um, in, in the change process of understanding exactly uh, how we need to implement flexible energy and how we need to implement batteries. I think personally, batteries are, are as I said, very important for the future because they can uh, be very be, they can be very reliable. And they have, um, if you use them correctly, um, be leading for, for, for giving us flexibility. So, for example, if you look at the Leander grid, um, we have in certain areas, um, let's say, an availability of this on our grid. And we see that the normal usage is maybe, let's say, 40%. Mm -hmm. But because we have peaks during over the years, uh, for example, uh, production peaks, uh, there's a bakery and there's another production company in the same area. And they have a demand statistically on the same moment why we have very high peak that goes w above our 100 percent capacity on that local grid so that means that we have a lock on that grid because so we say we cannot um uh, connect any more clients on that specific grid right because we have a too high demand if you look at the numbers if you look at the data it's only for a certain moments of time per year so mm -hmm. that means that if we would be able to give the flex to use flexibility to take away those peaks, so uh, peak shaving, mm -hmm. then it would mean that actually we could gain like 40 to 50% additional uh, capacity that we could physically give away to new new clients. So mm -hmm. that's 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 um, the thing that most, that, that's the issue that most uh, TSOs and DSOs are fighting with. What can we give away and how can we use flexibility to counter the peaks to do uh, a better form of peak shaving? But this is very theoretical and of course in the grid with various connections with multiple companies uh, clients that are connected it's it's a more integrated difficult story and with all of these new services and new technologies coming into the grid of course is going to require a lot more investment and i know that you've been looking into different sources of finance and private equity in particular tell us about your explorations there and uh, you know some of the conclusions that you're drawing about how utilities can work with private equity 
for the energy transition? Yeah, so this is very interesting. So um, one of my one of my targets, one of my goals is specifically find new products that can have a large impact uh, and can be implementable on a short notice. Mm-hmm. Because of course, the traditional way of um, changing the grid uh, congestion is, you know, as I said, we have this of capacity, so let's create more capacity. Uh, as we said, build build more cables in. Um, I have a philosophy in which I say um, we should use private equity and we should use the knowledge of private equity uh, parties to integrate it within within our energy system. So um, I call it make it make it bankable. Um, what I see from my experience from business to business and from grid providers is that um, our clients, the end users, they don't have uh, the knowledge. Um, about the energy transition. So most, let's say 95% of our, our percent of, let's say 90 to 95% of our clients have a limited to no knowledge about the energy transition, about energy, about how to optimize their energy systems. Mm-hmm. Um, second, they have no time and they have no uh, uh, interest to um, create more time, spend more time on how to improve their energy, uh, energy system. Mm-hmm. Uh, and third one, they don't have the money uh, or the investment uh, funds to invest actually in uh, uh, the, the, the the energy transition right. to renew their their energy. Uh, uh, let's say uh, to, to 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 buy batteries to invest in solar panels. Even if they have the money, they are not allowed to invest it because the return of investment traditionally in uh, renewable energy is way longer than let's say if they put it in a production line. So they will not get the approval from their board to invest in renewable energy, to invest in sustainable energy solutions for the company. So there comes the idea from what if we introduce, uh, let's say a CSP or a BSP, those are congestion service parties that are um, experienced in trading on the energy market. Those are parties that are certified in uh, working around the energy markets. Mm -hmm. And we combine it with companies that have the, knowledge in the engineering capacity to build good internal local on-demand energy systems uh, and we combine it with finance parties like private equity mm-hmm. uh, like bankers and we include that into uh, one form of contract in which we say okay we would like you uh, as a bsp or csp to provide a service and balancing service for the next 15 years on a specific area and you're going to get paid based on a sort of dbfm contract so mm-hmm. The summary is I'm working on a sort of, of a form of a DBM contract mm-hmm. in which we are allowing the, the, the private markets to invest, to give their own uh, input, their own knowledge, their own input into how would they improve a, a, a local system, a sort of energy hub, uh, but then before the meter to improve actually um, the energy system, what mm-hmm. makes it more easy for us because we can do a step backwards and we can let uh, the, 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 the BSP, CSP take over the stabilization. And this, we're working on a product and we're hoping it to get it uh, um, 85% ready uh, before Q1 next year mm-hmm. and to uh, present it at the market presentation uh, next year to uh, get the feedback from the market to say, hey, you know, this is what we're thinking about. This is a, uh, um, our 85% ready product. What do you think about it? Right. Okay, great. Yes. And um, you're, you're actually going to be speaking at SGT26 in Paris um, in that context. Um, so yeah, fantastic. We're looking forward to your presentation. It sounds very leading edge and innovative. Do you have any examples or similar, uh, cases that you're aware of across different parts of Europe, or is this a unique setup that you're introducing? Well, one thing that, that I've been hearing a lot is, um, it, it sounds very logical, but we're not doing it yet. So what, what I'm doing now is I'm just connecting the dots. Yeah. Um, uh, around various systems and around various various ideas and we're combining it into one integral contract mm-hmm. and we're trying to also uh, bring it to the market but right. um, for example the dutch grid system is full with batteries so we have um, currently a tenet is the tso and they have approximately 80 gigawatts on best on hold meaning right. that if you want to invest in the netherlands but you want to invest in uh, in a battery system you will not find a possibility to do it because there's no space on the grid. There's no availability on uh, station level. There's no availability on transportation level. So you will not be able to invest. So my message to the private equity market is if you really want to spend your money in the Netherlands, you want to invest in the Netherlands in energy infrastructure, you should take a look at 
the end users. You should look at the 90, 95% of the clients that don't have an idea yet about where to invest because those are a very inter interesting group because this is where you can actually put your money in, in smaller uh, projects that can be aggregated, uh, uh, go up into large numbers if you just have enough. So our task is to make sure that we create the good financing climate, that we create a good interesting finance climate for private equity, for bankers to actually be able to invest, to make sure there's a contract, there's a basis in which they say, okay, this is the framework here we can go. And on the other hand, uh, on the other hand I'm asking from the market, um, think about new business models. Mm -hmm. Think about new products that you need to develop. Think about uh, a new stacked revenue model in one in, in one which you not only get paid by traditional system, uh, a standalone BES, but you have a small BES, but you also have a small investment portfolio. You also have a small energy portfolio, which you, you, you share and you trade energy on local level. Right. Um, there is um, there is something that that's very very new. Mm -hmm. Market needs to, yeah, get um, I say adopt adopt this idea, yeah. and they need to be open for it. But I think this is really the way to go if you look at the energy transition because this is what we need. Because we can, for example, for the Netherlands, there is a estimated um, investment uh, uh, forecast of two hundred billion euros. Mm -hmm. What we need to invest in the upcoming, I think, twenty years into the energy transition, and that's so much money. That it just not, it, it just cannot be paid by the by the standard citizen of the Netherlands because that would just be too much. So this must come from the capital markets. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your insights today, Jeff. We look forward to hearing more about your project um, and the areas that you're exploring finance-wise at HGT26 in Paris. Uh, but for today, thank you so much and have a great evening. Thank you. Have a nice day. Join us again next week as we unpack another big topic shaping the future of the power grid. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Smart Grid Forums, and to follow us on LinkedIn. Until then, thanks for watching and listening. This is Powering the Future, a podcast series brought to you by Smart Grid Forums. One planet, one power grid.